<laughs> Whoa, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Depends on where you're listening. Hey, Shavar, how you doing? I'm doing good, man. Enjoying life. You know, I'm happy. I know it's, it rained this morning, but that's okay. Life is good. We're, we're alive. You know, we have our health and we move forward. Exactly. I mean, you know, all I know to do is take it a day at a time, sometimes a moment at a time. Um, life can be challenging, but we talk about something um, in recovery called life on life's terms. And that's something I've had to learn to, to accept. Just things happen and I've got to accept them and I've got to deal with them. And, and it's okay to feel overwhelmed and lousy about it sometimes, um, as long as I don't stay there. Absolutely. Absolutely. Focusing on those things and trying to figure it out, you know, and, and sometimes it's okay to have a bad, it is okay to have a bad day. It that's is right. okay. It is totally fine. People who are listening, it is totally fine to have a bad day. It's how you navigate through that bad day. Well, you know, it's, it's interesting. Most people, when you ask them how they're doing, like, what's their response? How you doing? I'm okay. <laughs> yeah. Or fine. Oh, fine. Yeah, yeah, pretty much, you know, fine. You know, I mean, I, I'm, I'm a victim of that also. I, 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 the reason for that is I want people around me to ask to, to have a good day also. Because normally when people ask me how, how I'm doing, I, I usually say, I do my best to say enjoying life. Because that's right. something people don't normally hear. And when, and when I first said it, people were like, what are you, what? Like in a positive way, like, and, they, and people would say, thank you for saying those words, enjoying life. In the back of my head, I had a whole, whole different <laughs> thought in my head. Right. But the outward, you know, I, I wanted people around me to feel that positivity and feel that within themselves. And it helped. People would just say, thank you for saying that. People were like, you know, I'm going to use that, enjoying life. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, and that is, I mean, no, most people don't say that. They usually just kind of give you back a quick answer. And very often the person who asks how you doing doesn't even hear what you said. Um, but, you know, I've learned to be more honest. And I'm not saying you're not being honest. I'm just saying for me, I used to be like, oh, I'm great. I'm really good. If I'm not having a good day, I'll be like, like you just said, okay. Um, or, you know, I'm, or I'm having a rough day or, but it'll be better. Um, because I, I realized that it doesn't do me any good to just give a false answer. Uh, no, I definitely agree. I've learned to do that also because the honesty is, is again, and I mentioned in this, I mentioned this in previous episodes and I talk about this a lot, about being human. Sometimes you have to allow the world to see that you're human. Sometimes you have to allow the world to see that, you know what, I'm not having a bad day. Yesterday I was smiling, tomorrow I might smile again, but at this very moment, all right, you know, I'm doing okay, I'm, I'm pushing through. And, I, and in, in recent days and months, I mean, I've been sharing, Ronnie, you know, my thoughts on what the world is is, is doing to us, uh, what COVID is doing to us, society, our country. And I had to be honest, it's like, it, it, it started to wear on me. And, and again, this all comes full circle to prevention. Like these things, how do people deal and cope with when you're going through systemic racism, when you, when you are quarantined in your house, you have nowhere to go. Like, how are you dealing with it? How, what's your coping mechanism? You know, luckily for me, I have podcasting. You know, I, I podcast mm -hmm. with Ronnie. I have a podcast with another coworker, and I just uh, finished my sixth episode of interview. I haven't released it yet of another podcast. So that's one of the ways that I'm coping with staying locked in the house, and I can't, I can't do anything other than edit audio. <laughs> huh, but you're getting good at it. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. And that's and that's really important. Practice mm -hmm. makes perfect. You know. And you only get better if you if you if you if you do it. Yeah, I mean we're learning new skills. I, when this started, I wasn't sure how I, was, I knew I'd stay busy, but now we're so busy because we're doing all this new stuff, and I'm loving it. I mean, the whole NYC pop thing that came out of this is so great. Fifteen coalitions working together to spread the message of prevention under like one title. Amazing. Um, this podcast has been incredible. Uh, it just we do what we have to do to cope. And I think that's important. You said that this is National Recovery Month, September. Mm -hmm. um, and it makes me think of all the people I've, I've seen, you know, die of overdose and die of this disease, um, the disease of addiction um, from substance use disorder. And it just, it saddens me because a lot of people are having trouble right now. And we've seen um, relapse rates go up tremendously. We've seen overdose rates go up during this whole quarantine. And, you know, we forget that there are people out there that we're not serving. And hopefully, you know, we can give people some type of hope. Um, but I think, you know, if anybody out there knows somebody who's struggling, check in with them. We talked about that the other day, um, checking in with your black friends, check in with your friends who, you know, have problems and issues with, with use, with substance use. 
um, with your LGBTQ friends who are isolated. There's people isolated. And if we don't check in with them and keep that type of connection going, we don't know what's going on. And we could be that lifeline. Sometimes you're that one phone call or that you know, one Zoom call uh, that makes a difference. Also checking with that friend who always checks in on you. Because <laughs> <laughs> right. that person might, you know, have that, mm -hmm. that veil over them, you know, saying, in the world believe that everything is perfect, but we, we never know, you know, we never know what someone is dealing with or how they're coping with the situation or if there's a situation. And sometimes there isn't. I don't want to go out on them and say that someone's going, going through something, but we never know. And trust me, just like, you know, they checking on you and you check, if you check on that individual, they will be just as grateful. They would, they would even check on you even probably even more because like, wow, someone finally checked in on me. You know, I've been doing all this checking in. But yeah, it's important to do that. Yeah, and sometimes we take things for granted and we do forget. And sometimes we, we forget to have fun. And it's so important to have fun, um, if you know what I mean. You know, you got to have fun sometimes. <laughs> I love the new filters. I love the new filters. <laughs> I've been having so much fun with these filters. Um, if you're just listening and you're not watching, um, I'm trying all the little new filters, the little cool sunglasses. Um, hats and and my fate one of my favorites is or i could be a pirate uh, <laughs> anyway sometimes we have to be silly uh, life's too short to take it so seriously my, my kids make fun <laughs> of me because i always want to have fun but dad be serious today okay i'll be serious <laughs> but, but then when I, like that. <laughs> <laughs> but then they then it's like they turn around and they want to have fun so that's that's my cool whatever you guys want Let's, let's get through the day. If it's, if it's having fun, watching a movie, playing a board game, uh, painting, which I, I, I realize I love doing, which is extremely relaxing. Uh, let's figure it out. Let's have fun. Let, let's support each other. And that yeah. goes out to every individual, like Ronnie said, a person who may have a, a, a drug addiction, a person who might be a part of a, a specific group, whether they're, they're Black, Black, Latinx, uh, LGBTQ+, plus, or, I mean, or, or a religious sect, whomever, Check in, support, figure out, you know, what they need. And you met, you never know, you guys might have the same things in common that can mm -hmm. help a person, that can give a person that light and say, you know what, wow, you like what I like. You like photography. You know, and, and that may change that person's view or what they're going through. You know, and again, it's not an absolute, but it's a, making the attempt is better than not making the attempt to help someone. Yeah, I mean, sometimes for me, when I get out of myself, I start to feel better. Right. That is really important, getting out of yourself. That's something that, a lot, you know, we think about, you know, what's stopping us, what's getting in the way. And sometimes it's ourself. Mm -hmm. We don't realize it at times until you, you have to, like Ronnie said, step out of it. Like, wait a minute, what's going on? What's triggering me? What's, you know, causing me to want to go into a, a different direction in life? what's pushing me to stay positive in life, you know, and, and, and positive can mean different things to everyone, you know, going in a different direction can mean different things for, for everyone. But in the sense of what we're talking about, you know, in drug prevention, like, you know, or in alcohol, like how, what's triggering you, what's there, you know, take that step back and, and look at it. Like, you know, is it school? Is it my, your partner? Is it finances? And how do you navigate? You know, one of the things I love to do is write things down. I love to write things down and figure it out. And this is old school. I still love the pen and pad. I mean, I, I love technology, but I still haven't gotten a, I tried the apps and all that, still haven't really <laughs> figured yeah. that out. I, the putting the pen to pad or pencil to pad helps mm -hmm. me out in writing out the pros and cons of any situation. You know, and whether it's a new job or, or staying at an old job or doing, you know, continuing education or becoming a parent whatever, like, you know, and that's just me. I have to figure it out. I have to write it down. You know, even, even in my creative process, I'm not sure about you, Ronnie, when you write music. I like, read it on, I read it on a legal path okay. or whatever. <laughs> but if I don't have one, I've, I've been known to pull out napkins and envelopes and anything, a label, <laughs> you know, if, if, if a creative idea hits me, I have to write it somewhere. I do sometimes write stuff on, on my phone. Like if I'm on, you know, if I'm somewhere where I don't have access to that and I just get a quick idea, I'll jot down the verse, or you know. No, definitely. I mean, we're we're in a technology age, and and I would I would agree to that also. I do use my phone, uh, depending on the situation. 
Like it all depends. But if it's something like if it's like a quick idea, like you said, I'm gonna write out, out do, 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 pull out the note, do, 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 and put it in my phone. Okay. But if it's something that I, I, I have this like real creative, uh, I, I'll I'll write and draw at the same time. I'll write and then I'll draw an image next to it to see to visualize what I just wrote. Yep, I need to do that. I'm just gonna <laughs> obliterate my face for a second because um, I have a dog who's asking to leave the room. So <laughs> I'll show you my, my mask picture. It's all good, and, and, and that's a, also people. If you're out there in the city or or, or country, wherever you please, make sure that you're wearing your mask. That is really important. We want to stop the spread of this COVID nineteen, and however you feel, uh, it's about you know supporting each other, supporting the world, supporting mm -hmm. the world, people around you. You might not believe it, but other people have, and, and people are in situations where we have lost loved ones, and yeah, you know, just just show the respect to that those people. You know, you I, don't. I'm yeah. school for it, Ronnie. Yeah, you know, I think a lot of people haven't lost people the way we have here in New York. Yeah. I'm wearing my mask right now, <laughs> <laughs> my virtual mask. Um, but we, a lot of people haven't lost people, and they haven't seen the effects of this virus like we have. Um, yeah. And, yeah. And, you know, I ask people who, when I see people posting about being angry about wearing a mask, I, I say, I don't want to get into a political argument with you. Mm -hmm. I'd like to know. Have mm -hmm. you, you know anybody who, who has COVID? Do you? have anyone you've lost due to COVID and nobody has responded to me when I've asked that question. Uh, and, and, oh that's and that's unfortunate. And that's always happens. I'm, I'm in the middle of a statement and someone, and someone jumps into our show. Well, we'll uh, continue. How about if we continue as we welcome her? We have No, a absolutely. Absolutely. All right. No, definitely. You know, it's important. And, and, and the unfortunate part is people usually get hurt when they lose someone. It's like, oh my God, it's real now. Mm -hmm. You know, and it shouldn't have to be that way. You know, we have a variety of things that happen in life that are still real. Oh, my God, there's a guest here. I know you said, hey, how are you? <laughs> hey, Gwen. Good morning. We meet again. How are you? I know. We were just in a budget meeting together. Uh, for, me, it's, for me, it's been a while. <laughs> <laughs> we're so glad you could join us today. Yes, yes, my pleasure. I'm excited to see what's going on. Well, what we'd like to do is we like to let our guests introduce themselves. So why don't you, you tell people who you are and what you do? Sure. Hi, good morning, everyone. My name is Gwendolyn Taylor. I am the Prevention Director at Children's Aid. Um, I oversee uh, PRC and all of the prevention services. Um, so it's, a, it's such a pleasure to be here with everyone. We're really glad you could join us. Uh, I mean, you You've been yes, doing yes. such great prevention work for so many years. And, um, you know, we like people to hear about that because it's very inspiring. Um, you know, it, people contact us a lot of times and talk about what they could do differently or what they could do in their environment. And we like to share that. So what, what have you been doing at, around this whole, you know, COVID-19 thing? I mean, our work stopped basically in March. Well, I, my last day in the office was March 13th we suddenly had to go into this mode. So how, what have you done to adapt to this within your programming? Yep, absolutely, absolutely. So ordinarily, the prevention program provides services to youth between the ages of 11 to 21. So we typically work with those children and their families. So when COVID happened, what we would normally be doing in person, we had to immediately switch to remote. Um, and so what we begin to do was provide telehealth services. So our telehealth services looks a lot like what we were doing in person, but now we're just on screen. So that consisted of um, providing evidence-based programs and counseling services. Um, <clears throat> we actually thought in, initially that it would be very difficult to engage um, young people, um, but we actually found out that it was, it was, it was very helpful. And not only did we engage the young people in which we had originally enrolled into our program and services, but a lot of their families wanted to be a part of it also, because now they were act actually actually able to see, you know, on real time, what we do with, with, with the um, youth. Mm -hmm. um, so the telehealth services has been, been wonderful. We had to take some of the um, evidence-based programs that we would normally do and transfer it into a more of a virtual model um, and that was a little challenging, yeah. um, but what, what we did was follow up with the developers of those um, models, and we asked for some guidance and some points. Nice. Some of them had already had virtual models, and some of them had to adapt. 
Um, and so we were able to utilize that. That's so cool that you're able to do that. And I, you know, I always say this to people, um, talk to the developer, you know, and, because one of the challenges we face work, you know, being in New York City is a lot of these programs, these evidence-based programs were not um, designed for urban use. And so, you know, even under regular circumstances, it can be challenging, but talking to the developer really allows you to, um, to meet those needs and still have your fidelity. So what, like, what are some of the evidence-based programs you're doing? I mean, can you describe a little and, you know, how they've gone? Sure, sure. So some of the ones that we continue to utilize is our um, Botvin Life Skills, um, um, Lions Quest, um, um, what's the other one? Strengthening families, we weren't able to adapt that um, this, this period, but we've been working with them to adapt it in the future. So in the fall, we'll be able to do, do that. Um, class action, um, RRR, that was um, remove, refuse reasons. Um, we were able to adapt that into an online version. So those, kind of, those are the programs we've been mainly working with. Um, Line wow. is, is basically for junior high school, and it's about 30 sessions. Um, so that was actually able to carry us through into this, into the end of the summer, into COVID. So that was really helpful. That's incredible. I, I know this is crazy. Every time I hear RRR, though, I think of pirates. <laughs> you know, and anyway, I, I was, <laughs> it makes me think RRR. RRR. <laughs> We've, we've been kind of silly with these crazy filters. Oh, I like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it's a great program. And, and the nice thing, it was developed um, locally. Yes. You know, to, by the diocese um, in New York. And, and that's, it, it's really wonderful to have a program that's been developed within the, the environments that we deal with. Um, but strengthening families, I'm, I'm sorry to hear that you weren't able to, to do that in the recent past, but that you're going, I'm glad to hear you're going to be doing it. That's one of my favorite programs of all time. Yeah. So, you know, they have a DVD model and they have, which is um, a shorter session, and then they have the 14 session model. Some of the parents we work with in the past, they still want to come in, um, even during COVID, because they want to take the training over again. So this year, we're definitely reaching out to newer parents who have never engaged in the program to try to get them engaged. Um, but we will be using both models. We're going to do a spring portion and we're going to do a, a, a fall portion and then a spring portion. Um, and we'll be doing it on, on Zoom um, for the first in the fall. And then we'll do it live, preventing there's no more COVID next year in the spring. We'll <laughs> do it live. I know. I know. I have my fingers crossed underneath <laughs> the desk. <laughs> the fingers crossed. Uh, yeah. yeah. I mean, this has been challenging. We were talking about that earlier. Um, could you... Could you kind of give a description of what Strengthening Families is? Um, so uh -huh. people listening uh, and are new to prevention um, can hear about some of the great stuff that is there on the menu for profession, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, professionals in prevention. Absolutely. So actually, Strengthening Families is probably one of my um, um, finer evidence-based programs. Um, I, I love it. It's a model that really engages the entire family. So whether you have young um, children to ages 21, whatever age there is, they can too be engaged. It also engages the mother, the father, who else, whoever else wants to participate. So the way that it really works is that it, it is three counseling groups. So we work with the teens separately, the school age children separately, and the parents separately. And the whole base of the whole basis of um, this model is really to have everyone on every age level engage in type of, in the same type of conversation. So whether it's working on building relationships with your children, better rapport, um, solving conflict and resolution. Um, so it's so many different topics that we engage in. Um, we do that separately. If we were in person, it would look like everyone would be in a separate group with a facilitator, talking about the same, having the same kind of conversations. At the end of this conversation, we all reconvene in a larger group and we discuss it all together as a family. And so the moderator or the facilitator, they lead that discussion. And it's really a time for the parents to be kind of open and honest and, and be a little vulnerable about how they feel with certain things. 
um, the kids are able to share. We teach skills like listening, you know, teaching parents and children to really listen and to try and understand what, what people are saying and how they can resolve and build their relationship. Um, ordinarily, what makes this so great is because we do this over a beautiful meal. So we try to get, um, we have some fried chicken, baked mm. chicken, macaroni and cheese, salads, fish, whatever the parents or the kid, young people enjoy. So what we want to do, we want to teach them the, the, um, the, 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 um, the base of a family meal, how a meal can actually bring people together, how a meal is really important when you sit down with the family and you begin to conversate, it just draws out um, so much positive energy. So because we're in COVID, we're not able to provide the meal. <laughs> so that's a challenge, but, um, but it's so powerful. And then at the end, they begin to share what they learned and build off of those skills. Um, it's 14, like I said, it's 14 sessions and the parents, then the children, they graduate. Um, to make our program more robust, we try to include incentives during our Shrimping Families. So whether that's gift cards or if there's a holiday or a, a special season that's coming up, we try to incorporate those kind of things just to make to give the, the families a, a, a chance to really to model for them some of the things that they can do with their young people, with their children. Um, we also make sure we provide a, a certification, a certificate of completion. Uh, we give them gift bags, Metro cards, all of those wonderful things to make the program really enriched. Oh, and I forgot, and we also take a family photo. So you get to have this beautiful family photo with your children and then all of us, of course. <laughs> I, just, I just have a few comments. You said that food food thing is a, the family dinner, I think for me is really important. We have Sunday dinner with my mom every Sunday and we do sit down and we're able to talk. And I think that's really important. I'm happy you guys do that. And you made me really hungry. And during this COVID, I gained like 25 mm -hmm. pounds. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and, I'm, I'm, and I'm processing, I know you haven't got a chance to use this program because of how it's set up. Like, like possibly the developers, if they listen to this, how can you reformat that, that dinner time via Zoom, where maybe it's a conversation piece, or because you can do like a, a screenshot photo, you know, but how do we take that same format of the dinner time? Because the, the, the important part of that is sitting down with one another. Yeah. Having that conversation with one. I'm sorry, go ahead, Mary. No, that's, that's a great, that's a great um, question. So in my, my, in my creative head, <laughs> that would hope we could do with that is because on Zoom, you are able to have breakout sessions, right? So we can have breakout sessions still with the young people. And then if we were even allowed, we can do a kind of a pre-planned meal, um, whether it's sending the kit, you know, now you can send um, cooking kits to people. Yes, right? yes, yes. You can cook your own meal. I can send you the box and you can prepare your own meal and have it prepared and, and ready um, for, for the group. Um, also to positioning, um, your camera or the computer in a way where we can see everybody. So whether it's on the, on the table or in the living room, so everybody can see the whole family um, in one space. So those are maybe some of the things that they can do, the developers can do if we have to continue to do some things virtually. But even on the DVDs, um, the way that they, they do it, they have it on the DVDs, it's also in a way in which it, it works um, remotely. That's pretty cool. And I, I was so many ideas ran through my head as well because yeah. like I use Zoom uh, on a weekly basis with my family since this happened, and for like the first seven or eight weeks, my mom did a cooking lesson yeah. for all my all my younger cousins or what have you. And I'm I'm not saying that that will be I said that maybe that's a possibility. And I think one of one of the coalitions that coalitions we work with, I think I was in Cacker Academy. And so, what, what was it, CAC? Or some, I was somewhere, one of these Zoom meetings. We've been in so many, I forget where I was. But <laughs> anyway, they mentioned something similar to what you're saying, was they want to do a pizza party for young people, and they were sending pizza to everyone's house. Mm -hmm. And then they, you had to turn your camera and eat the pizza yeah. with each other. And that's the same concept of what you're saying, which I think is a brilliant idea, whether they cook it themselves or the food is sent pre-made. But bringing that back together, bringing it full circle of, of sitting down, you know, I like the idea of having the, the phone, no one can see, I'm like pointing at things, <laughs> having the phone or the, or the desktop pointing in the direction of the family, I think it's a brilliant idea. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, even we have gone, um, we're, I'm trying to do actually a virtual sip and paint. Um, with, I've with done that too. 
Okay? <laughs> of course you have. <laughs> yep. So I sent them the link to order their kit, and we're all going to be online, and we're going to, I, I did a nice PowerPoint of the painting. We'll all be painting together. So, I mean, this COVID has uh, made people really think outside of the box, really challenge ourselves just to do things differently. And it's not a bad thing. It's actually been a good thing because now there's so many other possibilities that we can do that we just never, we never had to, but here we are. I know, isn't that something, you know, we, which says a lot. It says a lot for us as people, uh, resilience. I mean, and for young people, for families, we've been able to take something that has hit so many of us in a major way and still find a silver lining in there. Um, when we do go back, I don't think we'll ever go back to quote unquote normal. And I don't even know if normal is all that good. Um, but, you know, I hope this opens our eyes enough so that we can think outside the box. Um, moving forward, a lot of this stuff I can see just combining some in person, some virtual, but there's ways to like to use it all. Yeah. And uh, we don't have to, we no longer have to be relegated to one mode of doing things. We now can expand our possibilities and our horizons. Right, and, we re and we're reaching a larger audience. We're reaching people we never yes. had the opportunity to reach before. I mean, we have kids bringing in their friend, their cousin um, online because they're excited about what we're doing. Before we were limited to our targeted neighborhoods or um, targeted schools or sites, but now we have expanded, which is really, which is really important for prevention. It really is. I mean, we did a training recently and normally, you know, we've done a bunch, but normally these trainings would be stopped at 30 people or 35 people. We were at CATCA, we, we did training for 148 people. Uh, yeah. You know, we can train so many more people, we can get more people in breakouts. Um, but if, when you were talking about the meals, I don't know if you guys watch Diners, Drive-Ins and Dives on the Food Network. I, I sure do. <laughs> okay, well, they have this thing now, diners, drive-ins, and, and dives, where Guy Fieri has um, four different restaurateurs send him meal kits, wow. and he prepares their meals and, and the, their, their signature dishes that they send, and then he and his family taste it, and I was just envisioning these families doing something like that. Yeah, can you, can you imagine? I think that would be, be awesome if we're able to send them a meal kit, and then just having the kids in the kitchen, working with their parents, you know, yeah. it, that is building so many different skills. Um, that's, you know, when we talk about protective factors and, and being connected to family, those are all the things that we continuously talk about in our groups and it's happening naturally. Yeah, that's a beautiful thing. I mean, maybe even local restaurants would be willing to participate in something like that uh, through the Strengthening Families Program. Um, I mean, that's something to look into. So, you know, like, um, I don't know, some of the Harlem restaurants would be willing to, to send some meal kits. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. I, I think that's a great conversation with some of the developers, or then even, even as myself as a, as a director, if once I start to reach out to some local restaurants um, and letting them know what, what it is we're trying to do, um, maybe they'll work with us. Yep. Red Rooster. <laughs> <laughs> Red Rooster Mills, right? <laughs> I love Nate. Boulevard, by the way. I'm a big Boulevard fan. You know? I don't think I've ever been there. Oh, yes. <laughs> they, they moved. They were on 122nd. They were on 120, 116th Street. Mm -hmm. So shout out to Boulevard. I need some free food. <laughs> now, now, you mentioned families, and families come in a lot of different forms. Do you find that you get different family units when you do this? Yeah, so that's very interesting. Um, I, rem I can recall um, one of the um, Trunking family sessions in which we conducted. Um, it was the grandmother who was more of the, um, the spokesperson. She had the children. She kind of um, had, you know, was kind of like in charge. And then there was the mom. Um, and then there was an aunt that was a part. And then we also, surprisingly, we've had a lot of, of fathers. We've had single fathers. Nice. Um, we've had quite a, a bit of single fathers that come and participate. Um, we have, um, we've had um, uh, families who didn't have a mom or, or, the, or, the, or the biological mom. We had stepmothers. We had foster mothers. We had foster parents together. We have had um, parents who um, English was a second language. So I remember maybe two of our Shrimpany family groups, we actually had an interpreter 
<laughs> to help us trans translate what was going on. And we actually thought that it would be problematic and they wouldn't want to participate. And they felt totally comfortable. They felt totally comfortable with someone just translating. So we've had just a variety um, of, of just different, different, different types of families. Our background, um, we have mostly African-American um, families. We have some Hispanic families, um, a lot of African um, families. Um, so it, it really, it really d it differs. Uh, but what I want to what I want to say about the families too, it actually um, what impacts who we have is really where we do our recruitment, and so I think that's big too. A lot of the families that we have had in the past, we have recruited them from different places. One place um, has been our friend has been the local library. Would you believe it? Really, so, <laughs> the local mm -hmm. library. So our coordinate coordinator um, manager Eugene Hurd. Um, he actually formulated a relationship with our local library right there on 124th Street, where he would set up a table and he would, people would come in, he would introduce the programs and have them signed up. Um, so we were able to get just in the community, people who just frequent the library. Um, another place we did a lot of outreach was from some of our local shelters. So we had a lot of families that were living in shelters or temporary housing that was a part of our groups. And then we, uh, and then our our own, our own um, at Children's Aid, where we're at uh, Mill, B Mill Bank, Dunleavy Mill Bank on 118th Street. Um, a lot of our families that live in East Harlem, Central Harlem. So it really depends on where you're recruiting from, um, and who's getting the message. That's really what you get of your makeup of who's there. That's great, I mean, and it's nice that you're a you're able to serve different. Um, you know, neighborhoods, different populations, uh, because you're just being flexible th throughout the entire program. And like you said, it's, it's about adapting and thinking outside the box. Um, okay. Prevention doesn't just go one way. We got to be able to adapt it. Um, one of the things we always talk about is that um, prevention can be somewhat of a thankless type of job, although you're seeing more immediate results than what you're doing. But a lot of times the prevention will, will do things and we don't know for a lot of years if those um, efforts we put out there have taken effect. And for, you know, Shavar and I always talk about how we'll see our kids. And I say kids, cause some of my kids actually now have grandchildren. Um, they were young grandmothers or grandfathers. Um, and I'll see them 10, 20 years later and they, they'll tell me how much it meant what we did and how it changed their lives. I didn't see that a year after, I didn't see it five years after, but it had a long-term effect. And very often prevention um, is not given the credit it deserves or the funding because we don't see immediate results. But, yeah. but supposedly for every dollar we spend in prevention, we save an average of $10 down the road in, in other, you know, in consequences. That's a great point, um, Ronnie. That's an excellent point. I have been um, in prevention services, I want to say over 10, 15 years. And in this time, I have seen how prevention has evolved. When I first started the work of prevention, for one, we did not have to utilize evidence-based programs, right? So a lot of our prevention work was just basically having a group of kids, doing some pro-social activities, having a lot of fun with them, um, and kind of checking off like, yes, that's prevention. But we all know that since that time that we, OASIS um, has given us a standard, a baseline to live up to, which I think is really important. And they actually, we actually now have programs that are proven programs that work, evidence-based evidence -based programs that work. And not only that, but we also have the opportunity to implement surveys, focus groups, conversations, and document what, what, what it is that we're doing and how it's working. And then we also are tracking the kids from a period of time when they first come into our lives until after they leave. So we're not we're not just leaving the children anymore. We, they don't just go off into the abyss. Like, we know who these kids are, and they do. They come back and they thank us. We're able to track which evidence-based programs they receive, how much counseling they receive, how much dosage. And even though there's so many other variables, we also understand that a lot of the stuff that we have done has changed and affected their lives in so many ways, and they actually say that. So it's really nice when we have focus groups uh, and we're able to talk to kids about what works, 
what doesn't work, what do you think we should be doing? Just getting their feedback really kind of gives us a nice trajectory as to where we should be going with prevention. That's great stuff. And I think for anybody starting out in this field to be able to hear that or a program struggling um, to figure out where to go next, it, that's really validation. And yes, it's, it, we have evolved as, as a science. We are a science now. We weren't many years ago. Because mm -hmm. you know, I've been in this field since 1989 and I've seen such changes. And when I was you know, first in the New York City schools, um, that's what we did. We had a curriculum, but it was about hanging out and doing fun things and talking about our feelings and doing all these um, 60s kind of exercises. <laughs> but we have evolved. We definitely have. But um, Shavar, you look like you're sitting on a question. No, no, I'm listening. And, uh, I, and well, maybe I do. Because <laughs> like I'm listening in the tracking. Can you talk to us about the process of tracking young people, you know, and how, how long, you know, you said earlier, I think 11 to 21 year olds. And do we track that entire time? And what does it look like? Are they continued in the program? Like, are they, do they go to different schools? Like, how do we track that, that uh, information? Mm -hmm. Thank, that's a great question. So there's two things that I like to do. Um, the first portion is, of course, a lot of the curriculum have pre and post. So in, in, in that in itself, we want to know what you didn't know when you began, give you the, the, the um, curriculum or the program, and then we track to see how well or what you know after, right? So we want to know your knowledge. But I think uh, we're so fortunate to work for Children's Aid because Children's Aid has a lot of programs. So even when the, um, the young people or the families complete programs, they do not just leave. They are engaged and embedded into our after-school programs. They're engaged and embedded into our college access programs. So this is a way of tracking the young people that we're working with. So it's not like, okay, you finish RRR, <laughs> or what Ronnie said, R, <laughs> and then you just vanish. Right? So you complete a program, but you're still in after school. You can still receive prevention counseling services. There's still a prevention service, um, a prevention specialist that's there that's able to monitor and track you and make sure that you're engaging in all of our multiple services, whether it's at our Hope Leadership um, building, whether it's at Frederick Douglass, whether it's open during the summer. So there's so many services. And I think that's important for prevention providers when you're doing this work. It's not just about providing the evidence-based program. What else are you connecting these young people and families to after they finish your program? You can't just leave them because your portion is done. You have to make sure that that family is still receiving services or make the referral where they're connecting to, to something that's going to continue to guide them. And that's one of the ways in which we track. That's great. And it's like, we always talk about how prevention is more than just those programs. Exactly. It, it could even be just a relationship you have with a young person. It could be so many different things, um, helping them, helping families um, with their basic needs. I mean, this is all what prevention is. It's just getting people to a place where they, they have a better chance of succeeding in life and they have the skills and the tools they need to move forward. Um, and we do that in many different ways. Um, this is such great stuff. Well, I do want to say something, and I always bring this up in about prevention. And prior to me coming to the PRC, I was a program director for well over a decade. And, and I'm bringing this up because like during the interview, you know, we were talking and, and, and understanding what prevention is. Understanding at that time I was doing prevention, but not in the sense of drug prevention, but prevention and giving our young people opportunities. Like, like it's like both Gwen and uh, Ronnie saying, like, you know, the, the extra parts. Like if you, after they finish this program, how do you connect he or she or they to a, to a cooking program? And that's prevention. How do you connect them to an arts program or a basketball program? That's prevention. How do you, how do you teach a young person or, or a young adult how to write a resume? That is prevention. Like thinking outside of the box and how to connect those things and how to intertwine those things within each other. And our, well, I just wanted to say that because everyone else said it. <laughs> but how do we how do we create pirates? <laughs> like, and that's a really important. And knowing that the work that we do outside of the current work, if you're actually a primary prevention specialist or in that work, what are you doing outside of work is also considered prevention. 
and how will you use you know, those tools? Like doing cooking classes over Zoom, doing an art, uh, a, a painting class over Zoom. You're keeping that young person occupied and, and, and growing their mind, you know, giving them a growth mindset. This is, there are other ways to deal with these things. There's other ways to meet new friends or continue to can engage with your friends. Mm -hmm. That's all prevention. I just wanted to say that, that mm -hmm. people who don't think they're doing prevention, guess what? You are doing prevention. Shout out to the basketball coaches, the culinary art specialists, the art teachers, the archery coaches. You guys are doing prevention. That's right. That's Building right. those protective factors, like you said earlier. That's right. The other thing I want to mention, Shira, that you brought up, something we've been trying to do for a little time was have a prevention reunion. So we actually went to bring our kids and our families back um to check on them to have a reunion to talk about where they are and i think that's so important um to do periodically um because those those young people they grow up and you you see them outside on the street and you run into them and they're doing really well so we want to come up with a way where we can have regular reunions with some of the kids and families that we work with um just to also too if we have to refer again if we have to engage again but we definitely want to let them know that we have not forgotten about them. I think that's a great idea. Again, like Ronnie said earlier, and I talk about this all the time, there's no instant gratitude in the work that we do. You'll see that young person, like you guys said, six, seven years with a full beard <laughs> <laughs> or with a child or, or with a business suit or whatever the case may be. And they may say, hey, Ms. Gwen, you have no clue who they are. And you'll still, you'll still say hello anyway because you're trying to figure out who they are. And then it will always end up, thank you. Thank you for, for doing this for me. At the time, I didn't understand, but now I do. And it means a lot. So again, yeah. there's no instant gratitude, people. Keep pushing forward. Keep doing the good work. It is really important. They might not say thank you now, but when you see them with that full beard or a different body shape or whatever, big muscles or went from four feet two to six feet eight, <laughs> and they, or they're in a store or a restaurant and they give you the free they give you an extra piece of chicken because they remember you <laughs> it, it it does mean something it does it definitely does mean something now at the moment but in the future it does mean something yeah well this has been great um you've given such wonderful um feedback and experiences and i i like to end the show a lot of times when we have a guest and ask you know like a question that has nothing to do well maybe it does in some ways but I always like to know, what did you want to be when you were growing up? <laughs> what I want to be, okay, so I want to be a few <laughs> things. But I'm it. thinking, <clears throat> and I'm on the verge, I actually want to be a teacher, but now I, I really aspire to be a college professor. So um, in, in, the, in the realm of, of creative writing and writing in, in English and things like that, poetry, so um, if I can get into that field and just write books and write about life and all these interesting things, that is what I would, I want it to be. That is what I want to continue to do. <clears throat> Very cool. I see my degree is in English. Oh, um, yeah. I, yeah. I, will I will definitely be looking for your poetry book really soon. <laughs> oh yeah, please look out for it. It's I will look for those short stories. Yeah. And I will be pressing you. I'll be sending you emails. Hey, go ahead. I need, I need a poem for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yes. well, that's exciting. Yeah. Yeah. My undergrad is in English too. And somehow I okay. landed here. But I, also, I always think that there's for a reason because I've met so many beautiful people, wonderful things. I have so many, so many stories and experiences. It just makes me a richer writer. Ah, I love that. And uh, now, I, now I need to go write. Because <laughs> I'm always writing a book somewhere or a song or, you know, you know I think we're all creative people and, and so many of us gravitate towards this field. Um, most of the people I meet in prevention have another background and it's usually in a creative space. So it's interesting. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. This was great. Thank you so much, everyone, just for having me. And I'm hoping that we can be a help and, and push this prevention further. Thank you. Yeah, and you know, please come back and, and talk with us again. Thank you. Thank uh, you, Shabbat. Thank you, Ronnie, again. All right, see you soon. Take care. See you soon. Take care. All right. Well, Shabbat, that was very cool. That was cool. It was good to have Gwen on. That was dope. All right. Well, I think we're <laughs> at, we're at, at our time limit at this point. And, um, you know, again, we, we thank people for coming today and listening. Uh -huh.
to the solution. Nothing changes if we change nothing. And please subscribe to our YouTube channel please, or please, our please. RSS uh, feed, you know, in, in our audio version of this. But uh, it was really great to have all of you. And just remember that prevention really does work. It definitely does. And like Ronnie said, have a great day. Take care, everybody. See you next time.